This Gospel reading is very inviting. In a way, it's challenging. Let me reflect on this for a few moments. The rich young man is mentioned in all three synoptic Gospels. And therefore, the story must have been very important in the early churches of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you put all three Gospels together for a profile of this man, you will find out he's young, he's a ruler, he has power, and he's rich. And yet he's empty. There's something missing from his life. It appears in all three Gospels. So he runs up to Jesus. There appears to be an urgency about his search for something that's missing in his life. So he runs up to Jesus and he asks this question, what must I do to gain or inherit eternal life? He's legalistic. It gives us the impression that he can earn his way into eternal life. He keeps the law, he's law abiding. Because Jesus asks him about the Torah, you know the law. And he said, oh, I have kept all these laws since I was very young. He's a good man. He's legalistic. His interpretation of life is not based on relationship. It's based on law. It's based on fulfilling the law. But Jesus looks at him and he loves him. And then the young man walks away sad. He's sad because he had many possessions. Now this text and the teaching of this gospel has very little to do with wealth. It doesn't deal with money. I've read commentaries that say you have to give away your money. That's not the teaching of this gospel. I think it's far more subtle than the superficial understanding that they just have to give away the money in order to enter the kingdom of God. That doesn't fit the teaching of Jesus. This has to do with detachment. Detachment from the things that possess us. Why, if he sold all he had and followed Jesus, he would be powerless that doesn't fit our culture today, and it didn't fit in the time of Jesus. But how does it speak to us in the present age? To be powerless is not an invitation in our culture today. So let me talk about that for a moment. Way back when I was a young priest, a long, long time ago, I read Ian Rand, as many of you have read Ian Rand, Atlas Shrugged. And this uh, was her last novel, and it was her longest, and her, magnus, her, her great work, her ultimate work. And in this, uh, the question keeps coming up all the time, who is John Galt? Who is John Galt? And that's meant to teach us that nobody knows who he is. So don't ask a question that cannot be answered because you will be powerless. You must be in control. Her life uh, philosophy was called objectivism. And this meant that each individual's destiny in life is to capture their own happiness, not anybody else, just their own. And the noblest and the highest intent of a person's life is based on their achievement. And reason is the only guide. Not faith, not religion, only reason. And she expresses this very much in Atlas Shrugged, in the last great novel that she wrote. And in a way, it was born out of the Enlightenment, 17th, 18th century Enlightenment, and it found its way even into our culture today. It's a culture of individualism. The uniqueness of the individual, the dominant identity of the individual. Not, not a community, 
but the individual. So she took what was the best and the worst of the Enlightenment, the age of reason, 17th and 18th century. So if this man followed the invitation of Jesus, he would have to give up what he had and he would inherit a deeper and profound understanding of life. He would inherit eternal life. He never heard the invitation of Jesus because he was not in control of his possessions. His possessions controlled him. And when possessions control a person, they will not hear the invitation of Christ. So he didn't hear it. We're going to bless engaged couples uh, after the homily today. Now, what was missing from this man's life? What is it that money and power and prestige could not buy? Relationship. You can't buy relationship. Relationship is not based on power or money or social prestige. A healthy relationship must involve sacrifice. It must involve self-donation. It must involve putting a person before my possessions. And this will be true for these young couples that are getting married and will be blessed today in their engagement. Unless we have this extraordinary charism to put the value of a relationship first, no marriage will work. How could marriage work today? Because we're caught in Aeon Rand. We're caught in the dominant individual. Look at our culture. Look at our politics. Look at what's going on. It's the power of the individual, the arrogance of certainty, the dominance of the one person based on reason, not on religion or not on Jesus Christ. There is no profound core relationship that will last where people are trading and not giving, where control is the issue and not sharing. No profound relationship will last unless we have this fundamental statement of the gospel, divest yourself and share, give generously, give up what you covet, give up what defines you, and enter into a profound relationship that involves the sharing of the deepest part of who you are. Unless we have that, we're out for our own individual happiness, our own individual achievement, and we're led by reason, not by faith. We're led by the mind, not by the heart. And that's what this gospel is about. To what are we clinging in life that becomes an impediment in our core relationship? An opinion? What controls the relationship? What controls our relationship with Jesus Christ? Must we get what we ask? What controls our relationship with the church? Must it satisfy our needs? Must we have everything we want fulfilled in order to follow Jesus Christ? What is it that we have to separate from ourselves in order to inherit the meaning of life? Some years ago in one of my sabbaticals in West Africa, I came upon this story. In a small village, there was a temple immediately outside the village. And in that culture of that village, it was required 
once a year of every man, not the women, every man, to go once a year by himself to the temple of his God, whoever the God was. And at the entrance to the temple, he would take off all his clothes. And naked, he would back into the presence of his God, and he would sit there and wait until he heard the voice of his God telling him what his mission was for the next year. And after he heard his mission, he would go out, put his clothes on, and he'd live out his mission. His clothes became the symbol of all he possessed. The only way he could hear the voice of his God telling him what was asked of him was in his nakedness, without his possessions. But then he went out, he took his possessions back, and he lived out the gospel which was given to him by way of a mission. I was impressed by that. I thought to myself, we really do have to divest ourselves to hear the word of God. We have to be powerless. We can't be dominant. You have to listen. All prayer is listening. Prayer is not something you do. Prayer is something you allow. You allow God into your life. It's not something you conquer. It's not something you achieve. It's something you allow. You allow Jesus Christ into your life. But the only way in which you can hear the voice of Jesus Christ is in our helplessness and in our poverty and our brokenness. I know this in my own life. The times when I have felt the closest to God's infinite love and the presence of the God that I worship is when I was broken, when I was empty, when I was struggling, uncertain, unsure of where I'm going in life, and reach out to God in my nakedness, my emptiness, and then I heard the voice of God. I couldn't hear it when I was powerful. I couldn't hear it when I was just popular. I couldn't hear it when I was in charge and when I had control and I had power. I couldn't hear the voice of God. I was telling God what to tell me. And then I hit the darkness, the struggle, the emptiness, the nakedness, the poverty of life, and then I heard the voice of God. So this gospel it has nothing to do whether you have money or you don't have money. This gospel has to do with generosity, being powerless, letting Jesus Christ guide you in your life, which will find an incarnation in your core relationships, in your marriage, in your family, in your closest persons. Do you have to have the last word? Do you have to make judgments about other people if they don't agree with you? Do we divide ourselves because of our dominance, our possessiveness, our demand? That's what this gospel is about. If you want to listen to this gospel, <laughs> you'll find a space where you look deep inside yourself and you'll find that you desperately need to belong to your core relationship. You'll only find the value of your core relationship when you understand how needful you are, how broken you are, how dependent you are. Then you'll understand the Word of God. It has happened to you many times in your life where you went through failure, you went through struggle, you went through pain, and it drove you into the presence of God. And you said, reason will not solve this. Ian Rand, you cannot solve this. 
It's something beyond the power, the money, and the glory, and the prestige of this world. But I won't know that. I will not know that until I have listened to this word where Jesus says, you want to inherit eternal life. I mean, not when you die, but you want to live now in eternal life. You must become detached. The man who went into the temple in the Cameroon heard the voice of God. He went back on and he took on his possessions again but he understood his possessions now in a new and different way. Amen.